In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <coughs> Our Lady, Cordemtrix, Mediatrix of all graces, and Advocate of all people. Saint Joseph, Saint Maximilian Mary Colby, Saint Louis Greenland de Montfort, Saint Nicholas, our patron saints and guardian angels. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, before I continue on with Our Lady and her roles as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, I want to continue on with just something that I spoke about in the first talk, and that was um, sometimes you hear our Protestant brothers and sisters in downplaying Our Lady's role, they say that she was just an incubator you know, that she just gave birth to Jesus. And, and um, I think in one sense, they kind of downgrade and denigrate their own motherhood if they are a woman who's a mother. Because what mother is just an incubator? It's not like, uh, uh, you know, uh, human motherhood is not incubation and neither is the divine motherhood. Uh, and... Of course, Our Lady, her role, and as St. Bonaventure says, that the role of the Incarnation is Marian, or the mode of the Incarnation is Marian, not just in the first moment when Our Lady said yes to being His mother, but every moment since then, and even now, is Marian. So this relationship that our Lord established with His mother at the Annunciation at the conception in her womb continues on for all eternity. She will be his mother and she will be our mother. And she is uh, our mother now at this very moment until the end of time and for all eternity. She will be acting as mother of God and mother of the church. And it should, uh, because it's a relationship that has been established between two persons. In the case of human motherhood solely, it's a mother and a child. They always be a mother and child. And in the case of Our Lady and Our Lord, although one's a human person and one's a divine person, still that relationship will exist. That forever, Our Lord looks to His mother as His mother, because she is His mother. And Our Lady looks to her son, although he is her God, he's also her son, and she speaks to him as her son, uh, who is also the son of God. But even um, this idea or this false notion that Our Lady was just an incubator uh, really does, I think, offend God very much. And um, even human motherhood, uh, has recently been discovered, you know, a very interesting thing with the whole scientific method that we have and interest that we have with genetics. This recent discovery, probably in the back in the 1980s, they recently discovered that with all this being able to look at chromosomes and DNA, they discovered something which is called fetal microchimerism, which is a big word, fetal microchimerism, which means that we always n knew that, that between the mother and the child in her womb passes different nutrition and fluids, you know, and, and all this passes from the mother to the child. But they found out that there's also passing of not just fluids or whatever, but also DNA passes from the child to the mother. And the reason we know this is because when they were doing genetic studies of women and they would put markers in their genes to see things, they found out that these women had X and Y chromosomes in them. And they were just saying, where did these come from? And so as they examined these X and Y chromosomes, they realized that they were the chromosomes, if they were a mother who had a son, that the son left, a, we might say, a genetic 
marker in the mother, where he left his DNA in the mother. And some of these mothers was as many as 50 years since they gave birth to this child. And still they carry within them the DNA of their children, uh, of their sons, especially they were able to see this because it showed out so clearly because they had X and Y instead of XX. And um, so if that was the case, or that is the case with just motherhood between two human persons, then could it possibly be that our Lord left some of his human genetics in his mother, and that's why she also had to be immaculate. Because she is, as we refer to her in the litany, the spiritual vessel, the vessel of honor, that she, became, she was not just an incubator. She's not an incubator. She's a mother who would retain some of the DNA of her child within her own human body. And so she was a very sacred vessel and had to be a very sacred vessel because she would have this genetic uh, of her son remaining in her. So it's something that, you know, even modern science can um, maybe give us further evidence of why uh, God's plan was the way it was and why it is so important that Our Lady is immaculate. It doesn't... Um, just doesn't um, do anything but uphold further the teaching of the church. If any science is true science, it will always support the highest of all sciences, which is theology, and won't in any way uh, do anything to show that there's some kind of a contradiction. But this aspect of, of fetal microchimerism uh, is... Um, a very interesting discovery, which uh, to me, at least I see it as being further evidence of why Our Lady had to be the Immaculate, uh, immaculate Conception. Uh, we are going to continue on looking, and especially we're going to use the Bible, sacred scripture, to show these different roles of Our Lady as the Mother Suffering, the Mother Corredemptrix, as the Mother nourishing the mother who's mediatrix and of course the mother who is an advocate the mother who is interceding and pleading on our behalf now you can look at the this fifth dogma you want to call it as coredemptrix mediatrix and advocate if you look at redemption as being the primary importance of our lady's work or you can look at it from a more franciscan role which sees it as being her priority was first being a mediatrix, then co-redemptrix and advocate, because really the divine maternity was always intended, and so she first was a mediatrix because she is a mother. Matter of fact, Pope John Paul II says, you cannot say mother without meaning mediatrix, because what is a mediatrix? One who stands between two parties, who's in the middle, and every mother is a mediatrix. Not just the mother of God, but every human mother. She stands between the father and the children. And as a matter of fact, she's the connection between the father and the children. How do the children know who their father is? Because the mother says, that's your father. That's the one who points out and makes the connection. And St. Maximilian Colby says it's even the same, you might say, within regards to the divine family. He says, you cannot have God as your father and Jesus as your brother, unless you have Our Lady as your mother. That's the one that binds us and connects us to the divine family. And he's very clear about that in his um, writings and his teachings, the importance of this entrance into this relationship with Christ and with the Holy Trinity is through Our Lady. Even if you're not even aware of it, even if you don't even accept it, like our Protestant brothers and sisters, you know, they don't, even if they don't accept the fact that Our Lady is their mediatrix, that doesn't matter to Our Lady. She's not going to, that's her role. And that's the divine economy. That's the way it works. You know, just because you deny gravity doesn't mean that gravity ceases to exist for you. It's there whether you want to accept it or not. Our Lady's mediation is as part and parcel and foundation of the way God works 
as gravity is in the natural order, if you, you can't get away from it, you know, and you have to accept it because that's the way it happened. You know, you can't say, well, uh, you can't say to God why he did it this way because he did it this way. You just have to accept that God came to us as a child of Mary. She is our mediatrix. She stands between us and Christ. And we see her as first and foremost acting as that mediatrix. She stands between Christ and the rest of the church. Uh, you know, if Christ is the head, St. Bernard pointed this out, if Christ is the head of the mystical body, which we all accept and recognize, and we are the rest of the members, there has to be a neck that connects the two, the head with the members. And Our Lady is the neck of the mystical body. And um, there's a humorous little uh, proverb in Polish which says that the husband is the head of the family and the wife is the neck, and wherever the neck turns, the head follows. And in many cases, that's the way it is in God's family, in, in the mystical body. Wherever Our Lady turns her neck, whatever she looks to and says, the head looks, he follows what she says because he's made it that way. He's established it that way. We can see the, that very clearly in the wedding feast of Cana where Our Lady is exercising her maternal mediation. She says, son, they have no wine. The neck is looking to the need of this couple and she points out this material need, but she is also pointing out something far more importantly, the spiritual need. That she's not just referring to the fact that they lack wine for this wedding celebration, but she's pointing out to him because she knows that if she tells him to work this miracle, that he begins his public ministry, his public walk to Calvary. In many ways, she's saying mystically to her son, son, they have no grace. Because wine is always seen as being a blessing from God. You know, God's not a teetotaler. <laughs> God, you know, wine is praised in scripture as, you know, bringing mirth and joy to men. Uh, so this is what grace does. It brings joy to man because grace is something that we're lacking. And she's saying to her son, son, they have no wine. And he says to her, woman, what to me to thee? My hour has not yet come. Obviously, our Lord is understanding they're both on the same wavelength. He knows she's not just talking about wine. Because he says, my hour has not yet come. Hour always means pointing to his passion, pointing to his redemptive work. And Our Lady doesn't question or ask him anything more. She, in one sense, by turning to the servants, is saying, yes, it has come. Because she turns to them, to the servants, and says, do whatever he tells you. And at that, we know that 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 what our Lord said to her was, was in one sense saying to her, you know, mother, this is not only going to be my work, but also involving you. Woman, what to me, to thee? What is this of our concern that they have no wine? And it's almost as if our Lord is just saying that as a rhetorical way to, to get us to pay attention to this mystery that's going to be worked here. And it says that he, you know, uh, without even saying anything more, by the time they draw the water and take it to the head waiter, it has been turned into wine, the best wine. And um, so Our Lady's acting as a mediatrix there at the wedding feast of Cana. But even before then, right shortly after the conception of the God-man in her womb, Our Lady, as we know, makes haste to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And at, at, the, at the visitation, she... Elizabeth tells us, the moment your, your greeting sounded in my ears, the baby leapt for joy, and that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And there we see St. John being sanctified, but it's through the mediation of Our Lady. God waited for her voice to sound in the ears of Elizabeth before John was sanctified. God could have done it by just, you know, willing it. But he used her instrumental mediation of Our Lady to say what was the traditional greeting. I'm sure she said, Shalom, Malayam. You know, peace be with you. 
and truly and literally the peace that only God can give, which is the peace of being sanctified, being righteous, being made holy, which is what happened to St. John in his mother's womb. Not only did it fill John with joy that he leapt for joy, gave out that great kick of joy of being sanctified, but even filled Elizabeth with, with joy that she praises Our Lady. She says, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, if someone should say to you that mother of God is not a scriptural title, they don't know their scripture very well. Because every good Jew could never say the name of God, Yahweh, the sacred tetragrammaton. They could not pronounce that word. So they had substitutes that they would use in the Psalms and in their prayers. They would be, be Adonai, El Shaddai, Elohim, all these other names that they use as substitutes. Our Lady Saint Elizabeth at that moment said, Who am I that the mother of my Adonai should come to me? What she's saying is, who am I that the mother of Yahweh, the mother of God, should come to me? So mother of God is a, a scriptural title. She's, she was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit allowed her to recognize Our Lady's divine maternity. Elizabeth didn't even know she was with child. Our Lady didn't even get a chance to say that. The Holy Spirit let her know that. Our Lady was only a few days pregnant with Christ. And yet the Holy Spirit let her know about this great secret that Our Lady contained in her womb. And of course, Jesus made his presence known through the mediation of Our Lady. So we see her working there as a mediatrix. We see her at the wedding feast of Cana acting as a mediatrix. We see her at the foot of the cross acting as a mediatrix mediating especially her work as co-redemptrix, as mother suffering. Because our Lord points out to us, woman behold your son, son behold your mother. And as he wants to make it even more clear to us that what is taking place is an act of maternity, what is our Lord's words, his last words on the cross? It's not, it is finished. If you look at the Latin, it is consummated. A marriage is consummated. A woman is made a mother at the foot of the cross, a spiritual mother. This is where Our Lady's spiritual maternity is explicitly proclaimed by Christ himself. Forever she will be our mother because she is the mother of John, the mother of the beloved disciple, and she's the mother of us all. So her maternal mediation is existing even to this very day. And St. Maximilian Kolbe, he says here in his, some of his writings, he says, it irks me at times to read the over-careful emphasis that after Jesus, the mother of God is our entire hope. Certainly it is possible to interpret this phrase correctly, but this excessive carefulness in order to pay respect to Jesus without omitting this phrase seems to my mind to bring discredit to him. Let us imagine a rotary press arrives just when the platen presses were not sufficient. And we can justly say that in order to publish the night on schedule, our whole hope rested upon the rotary. If nevertheless, someone would immediately add, after the factory, which built the press, he would thus give the impression that the machine could break down and would have to be returned to the factory. In other words, the factory did not build the press very durably. This would scarcely be a compliment to the factory. You know, that our ladies, the mediators of all graces, we don't have to keep saying, and also they all come from Jesus, but Jesus has given them all to her, and she is the most reliable distributor of those graces. That we don't have to say, and also Jesus, because she has, does such a perfect job, that in one sense you would kind of be insulting Jesus, if you kept making allusions to him as if somehow you were afraid that, you know, she might fail him, but she will never fail him. She is the perfect disciple, and that means she's the perfect mediatrix, and she gives to everyone all and only what Jesus wants them to have through our, her maternal mediation. He says, he goes on to say, St. Maximilian, the Immaculata is the mediatrix of graces, 
She is overflowing with grace, and we receive that superabundance of grace. If we were to look into the interior of our soul, we would see how much activity of the Immaculata there is and has been in our souls from the dawn of our lives to the present moment, and how much assurance of her benefits for the future. These are, for the most part, my, these are, for the most part, mysteries of each individual soul. It is enough to mention that every grace received, each day, hour, and moment of our life, is her grace, flowing from her motherly heart that loves us. In her womb, the soul was, must be regenerated according to the form of Jesus Christ. She must nourish the soul with the milk of her grace, caress, caress and rear us in the manner in which she nourished and brought up Jesus. The soul must learn to know and to love Jesus at her knees. Let us draw love for him from her heart. Yes, love him with her heart and through love become like him. The end of every man is to be godlike through Jesus who is the mediator with the Father and of Jesus through the mediatrix of all graces, the Immaculata. It is incredible that anyone should approach Jesus without Mary. Why? For omitting the very fact that she brought forth Jesus and raised him for us, the approach to Jesus is without doubt a grace in itself. But all graces come to us through her in the way that Jesus himself came. It is then permitted to converse directly with Jesus if I do not think of Mary? It is not a question of feeling or thinking, but of the fact itself that it is so, even though the thought of her intercession would never cross your mind. If you really love Jesus, then above all, you desire to do his will in all things and receive graces in the way that he ordained. When you have such a disposition, you can and ought freely turn to the sacred heart of Jesus, being confident that you will obtain everything if someone, however, were to tell himself, I do not need any mediation, I do not need the Blessed Mother, I myself am able to praise and honor the most sacred heart of God and ask for what I need, would Jesus not cast him justly aside for such insufferable pride? And so he's saying that, you know, those who would somehow think that they don't need Our Lady's mediation are like cutting their own throats, you might say. Because that's the way grace comes, whether you recognize it or not. And you know, Our Lady's so humble, you don't even have to recognize it. All those Protestant brothers and sisters out there who think they're going straight to Jesus, they're getting those graces through Our Lady's mediation. And of course, we know that Our Lady wants to <clears throat> bring them all to Jesus most perfectly. So I'm sure that when it comes to wanting to move them to come to the church, that's a grace that we also ought to pray for, that she wants them all to enter into the church and experience this great relationship, not to wait until heaven, but to already experience this great maternal re relationship with the mother, but also to have that most perfect union and full union that one can possibly have with Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. So. If it's truly an ecumenical movement that wants to work for the union of all Christians, it's the union is to bring them back into the one fold that Christ has established. And that's truly uh, an intention and a desire that is closest to the heart of God and his most holy mother. So Our Lady is mediatrix. She is, she is nourishing us Today that you're, you received a grace to come here today, she nourished you at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Even the graces of the sacrament are mediated by Our Lady. She helped you to be disposed properly so that you could receive the graces of the sacrament when you received our Lord. St. Maximilian Colby says even that you should even, the best thing you could do at the moment of, of communion is to, to just say Our Lady's name and to ask our Lady, to help you to receive Jesus like she did. Um, and Pope John Paul II made an allusion to the fact that Our Lady is present at every holy sacrifice of the Mass. She stood at the foot of the cross, the first Calvary, and she stands at the foot of every altar at the representation of Calvary. She is truly present at every sacrament. When baptism is given, 
When one becomes a child of the church, it's because the mother of the church is there, mediating that grace. When one is filled with the Holy Spirit at confirmation is because the spouse of the Holy Spirit is present there, mediating her spouse and the grace of confirmation to that soul. And the priesthood, the mother of the high priest is there when that priest is made an altar Christus. And at wedding, at, she was at that first wedding and feast in Cana, our ladies present at every marriage, which brings about the likeness of Christ and his bride, the church. And the utmost bride of the church is Our Lady that shows this great fidelity of spouse, of bride and bridegroom. Christ is the bridegroom. Our Lady is the bride par excellence of Christ. And this Our Lady wants to mediate to those two newly wedded couple that they will live out this fidelity as she lived out her fidelity to Christ as the bride par excellence of the church. And uh, all the sacraments, at the anointing of the sick, Our Lady is there as the mother wanting to give the graces for the final entrance into heaven or to give them the graces to restore them to health. Our Lady is there truly as a mediatrix in all things. We're going to move on now to the, you know, one of the things I thought would be good is that I keep thinking of um, the statement of Cardinal Newman, who when he was accused, you know, by a Protestant friend, he said, oh, you Catholics think that every page of Scripture speaks about Our Lady, and he says, you're wrong. We don't think that every page speaks about her. We think that it screams about her. I thought it would be interesting to go through every Bible of the book, beginning with the book of Genesis, and just as you go through highlight all the types of Our Lady that appear in, just in the, God, in, in the first book of Genesis, just to find all the types of Our Lady. And I think it probably would take a long time just to do the book of Genesis, but then to go through that, after that, go to the next book, and to truly see that what Blessed Cardinal Newman said is true, that Our Lady is screaming out, but that was probably the greater Grace, You know, they say that everybody who goes to Lourdes doesn't come, up, come away being empty-handed. We know that Our Lady works miracles at Lourdes, but probably one of the greatest miracles that she works is for the many souls who go there with some terrible affliction, and they come back with joy knowing that that affliction or suffering has a greater merit. Of course, it's all going to come to an end at the resurrection on the last day. You know, but that merit that one might have by bearing some cross or some suffering out of love for God, if you're to see the merit, you might say that you're going to get in heaven waiting for you because you carry that cross, then you might say, I'd like to keep it for a while longer, you know. Even St. Teresa of Avila said, you know, if you realize the great merit that you have for carrying those crosses or those sufferings that you have in this life, which maybe sometimes we like to complain about. She said, if you saw the merit that you have for bearing with them with patience and love for God, that you would pray for more. And now that's how the saints see things. We probably just say, well, I hope to just handle what I get. But to be able to pray for more suffering, that really is the heart that a saint has and how they see things. So we're going to have a little break here, maybe five minutes, and then we're going to come back and talk about uh, Our Lady as Advocate and our response to this great mystery of what's in it for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> 